um, it's a funny show because it opened up in November in Lisbon, but it's not going to open now until October in Rotterdam. So it's been really quite a long run. And the reason for doing the exhibition in the very first place was the fact that the Gobenkyung was about to celebrate the 50th birthday of the museum building. And the museum building itself was often talked about, but the interior was not very often talked about. So I did a lot of research, both in Lisbon, but also in Italy, to try and find out more about what had inspired the museum interior. But what I thought I would do here was just to start a little bit further back um, and go into a kind of backstory as to why this was so interesting to me. So, oh. um, sorry, sure. Okay, so um, I've always been quite interested in the way that people walk around museums and whether they walk uh, in a straight line or in a curvaceous line and whether they meander or whether they can head towards something that they can spot in the distance. And in a way, I think that my recent experience has been a bit like that. So in many ways, what I was trying to explore at the Gobenkian was a contrast to what I had explored at the Tate. And just to make that a bit clearer, the Tate, of course, um, is very frontal and very high. And I spent a lot of time thinking about its ground plan, which is very long and very much based on enfilades. And we spent two or three years, both me and the curators, but also working with Adam Caruso particularly, thinking about the the fundamental architecture of the Tate and the, I suppose the footprint of the building and how that relates to the footprint of the visitor. And I think I'm very concerned with trying to match the two up so that the way that you walk around a building matches the way you look at the art. So the original enfilade, which many of the British people who are listening to this will know very well, um, were very classical and certainly led you down a long aisle, as it were, towards um, an end view. And the new building, the new restored galleries in the quadrant that was uh, restored by Caruso Sinjan was also very much based, I think, on a, on a long view. And I think I hadn't realized when I was at the Tate how free we were in terms of being able to show the art because I felt we were quite governed by the architecture and I wanted to use that uh, constraint in a, in a creative way. And a lot of the thinking was about how to show the collection and also how to make the viewer's journey through the collection easier. And we use these date lines on the threshold to allow people to think about walking through time. Um, and it was, a, I think, a fairly natural idea to think about, now I'm in the 1540s or now I'm in the 1650s. And it, I would say this um, rehang went well and it was very well received by the public and even well received by the press, which is not always my experience. Um, and when I moved to the Gobenkian, I felt that the, the fascination of the Gobenkian building, which is this, building was very much the opposite, a very horizontal building and one that was uh, very homogenous as well because the Tate had been built over, over a century in many stages, whereas Gulbenkian was built all in one go and it opened in 1969 and that was why we were celebrating its 50th birthday. In fact, it had been uh, researched quite intensively since the mid-1950s and one of the things that interested me about the Gulbenkian was that in a way by the time it opened it was already old-fashioned but I think in a good way and that's probably why it's lasted because the the team working on it had um, over a decade to work on it. Now we always knew that the Portuguese team who designed the whole Gulbenkian complex, Latugia and Pessoa and Seed, um, won the competition. Famously they won the competition uh, for the Gulbenkian building. But we hear much less about the fact that the interiors were advised by an international panel, Georges Henri Riviere from Paris and Franco Albini from Italy and Leslie Martin from England. And there's very little paperwork documenting how they advised. We can see that they were paid their, their fees, their retainers for over a decade. 
the Gulbenkian even went so far as to pay Albini's parking fines in Lisbon. But there's not very much documentation at all about what they actually did. So in fact, in the end, it was by going to Genoa that it became absolutely clear to me that Albini really was behind many of the design decisions in the museum at the Gulbenkian. Not the building, but the way that um, the allestimento, as it would be called in Italy, um, came to happen, came to pass. And just um, to move on to a, a ground plan of the museum, you see here how you might say it's based on a, a Mesian courthouse design, but the, the circulation routes are, are very almost almost aleatory, they feel aleatory. And I think one of the, uh, the reasons I wanted to explore why this show, why this building works so well is that the viewer doesn't feel they know where to go, but in fact, they never get lost. It's a very comfortable building to go around and most of our visitors really enjoy their experience. They're often not necessarily able to put their finger on why they enjoyed it. And that was one of the reasons to think about this exhibition. So you can see here the when you come in, in fact, there are two ways you could go, although visitors are encouraged to go to the right. And they walk basically um, around the, the two gardens in the center. Um, and there are, there are it's, a, it's a modular plan, but it's not rigidly adhered to in that it's broken up in different ways. So it was thinking about uh, the experience of the museum visitor, but also, especially about the interior design, which unusually has in many cases um, been perpetuated. So unlike many museums of this period, I, I would say the majority of the museum is still in place. Um, and I think that's partly because it's always been recognized as being very successful. So for example, this monumental showcase, uh, which displays the Chinese porcelain collection, is still there and it's a, a very, very strong architectural experience. It's powerful, but it's not overpowering. And that, I think that's quite unusual. Um, it, it has perhaps meant that the museum has been a little too static um, over the last 50 years because of, the, of its very success. Of course, the difference between the Tate and the Gulbenkian is that the Gulbenkian is largely showing objects and not paintings. So you need cases. So cases are very important. And I think this is one area where you begin to understand why Franco Albini was so important. In the area where the paintings were shown, they were originally shown on these panels. Um, and these panels have tended to mean that people <clears throat> have thought not of Albini, but of Scarpa. And people who know the work of Scarpa almost immediately jump to the conclusion that it's Scarpa who was the influence behind the building. And as an example, here's the one of the rooms in the Museum, Museo Correr in Venice, which of course reminds people of what they've seen, especially um, when this painting installation was originally in place. They think of um, Scarpa as the <clears throat> the governing influence in the Gulbenkian. And it's true that there were Scarpa-like elements in some of those original ways in which the paintings were installed, as for here, as in here. But knowing that Albini was on the advisory panel led me to want to really ex examine much more strongly the role of Albini, but at the same time to think about how we might be able to make an exhibition that was not all about the Gulbenkian. And I wanted the exhibition to travel and it will go to Rotterdam and Dirk van den Hovel will speak a little at the end of this about, I think an almost complete transformation of the exhibition in Rotterdam. Um, but I also thought it would be interesting not to make the show too archival, too historic and too inward looking, because I think in the past the Gulbenkian has been very often inward looking. And instead to think about um, the context, the wider context. So Albini is there, and I think we can see that there are similar examples of Albini using easels and putting paintings on easels against backdrops, which uh, figure in the Gulbenkian building. And there are other moments which are even more precise and which mainly we tried to show through the catalog and through a very modest display that we did in the museum itself. 
and not so much in the exhibition. So for example, a famous set piece in the Gobenkin Museum is this um, beautiful setting for the Udon Diana against the garden. But I think that here the, the inset pool almost for the sculpture can be quite directly related to the treasury building that Albini was working on with Franke Helg just before the Gulbenkian was built. You can see here the sculpture, the shadow, the inset uh, case and the inset pool on the ground. And these particular features I think are very uh, closely connected to Albini and to my mind make it clear that he had a really strong role in the Gulbenkian even if we no longer have paper work to prove that. And there are other examples, for example, here we have the drawings made for two of the vitrines in the Islamic gallery. And we have lots of drawings, but they're not named or signed. Um, so they're generally anonymous. They were made by a huge department of works working in the Gulbenkian at that time. They were doing not just projects in uh, Portugal, as here in Lisbon, but also a lot of buildings in Iraq at the same time. So there were many, many draftsmen working in this department. So most of the drawings are anonymous. But these drawings clearly relate to these cases, I think, in Genoa, where the surpluses are shown in the cathedral treasury as well. So my feeling was that Albini's uh, fingerprints were all over this building, but I decided, for better or for worse, that we shouldn't make a show only about Albini. The Islamic gallery, which we still have, and is very little changed from this original photograph from 1969, um, is also quite closely connected to the museum in Padua, which uh, was begun by Albini and Helg and finished by Helg after his death. And so this uh, similar use of kind of compartmentalizing the walls, metal frames around the materials and then here it's mosaic rather than the carpet such as we have in Lisbon, but the similar use of the slightly raised uh, ground platform uh, for objects and I think a very similar kind of rhythm in the way that things are spaced out down the, the length of the room um, and, you, and you would move in a rather curvaceous way around it. So that was just a kind of a, a prologue to to the exhibition itself, which opened in November 2019, just a month later than the actual 50th anniversary of the building. And I'll move on now to talk about the, the different areas in the museum, sorry, in the exhibition. So we began with Albini, but it, it was very much um, only one of the different sections. And what we have here, perhaps of all, the groups uh, is particularly a composite selection. And we had uh, quite a lot of, well, we had a lot of discussions and I think that the Dirk and I are credited as the co-curators, but we have an architect in Lisbon called Rita Albegria, who I know is watching this, um, who was really very, very important for both of us in terms of working on the technical details and not just technical, but also conceptual in terms of thinking about the, all the parts of the exhibition. And I think that one of the reasons that I particularly wanted to not be too much alone in making this show was that I thought it might be very controversial. In the end, it wasn't very controversial, but I, I thought that I needed help and backup, and um, especially from an architectural historian. So I asked Dirk, for I think two or three reasons. One was that it would be nice to work with him. Another was that it would be nice to have the show travel. And I thought the Architectural Institute or the new Institute in Rotterdam would be a good place for that. But also given the fact that almost from the beginning, it seemed clear that the Smithsons and also Van Eyck would be part of the exhibition. Dirk has done a lot of work on both of those architects, all of those architects. Um, and therefore I thought it, would, it made a very nice kind of natural uh, collaboration. So we, we worked on the Lisbon installation quite closely together. Um, we have an exhibition gallery in Lisbon, which is a thousand square meters. So we had ample space and more space than in Rotterdam 
to, to do this in areas which wouldn't need to be rigidly separated from each other and uh, allowed a flow from one to the other. But perhaps in terms of a uh, controversy, I think maybe the Albini was one of the more controversial. We quite early on decided not to create anything exactly and not to create anything in its totality. So the idea of fragmentation was important from the outset. That was partly because it was easier, but also I think to uh, make it clear that we weren't proclaiming, claiming that anything was a full reconstruction. And the other thing that made our job immensely easier, and I think much more creative, was that we could use the Gorbenkian collection. So whereas with many other recent attempts to reconstruct old exhibitions, there's often been a, a related attempt to find all the original artworks that were first on show. Here we found artworks that were more or less similar, the right type. Unfortunately, the Gorbenkian has two collections, the Founders Collection, the Gorbenkian Collection, and the Modern Collection. So this gave us quite a bit of scope to find things from different periods and different types. And it meant that we were able not to worry too much about, and not to worry at all about the loans, and really to focus on the architecture and the means of display. And uh, after we'd worked out on, worked out the ground plan and worked out which elements of the architecture we wanted to redisplay, then we really went down to the reserves and found the artworks that fitted the display. So it's very much the opposite way around from normal. And actually that was one of our challenges in communicating to our public. A pub, the public who come to museums and exhibition galleries are used to looking at the art and we had to really make a point here, which was hard. Look at the display before you look at the art because the art was, uh, you might say by chance really. We could have had many different landscapes or portraits religious paintings or uh, allegorical paintings. We, we found things that worked and that made sense with the architecture, but also with the way that the architects had responded to certain kinds of art. So as I said, this is a, a composite, the Albini. It's a mixture of the chairs from one place, the painting on a lever arm from another place, the three paintings on the transparent screen from another exhibition in another country, and then the poles which um, come from uh, Genoa. So we have th three elements here from Genoa, both from the Palazzo Grassi, sorry, the Palazzo Branco and the Palazzo Rosso, and then the transparent screen um, is based on a project that he did with Franca Hild in Sao Paulo. So there's the original in the in Genoa, in the, in the Palazzo Branco. This is our lever arch, lever painting. There's the original in the Palazzo Rosso, which um, was designed to be very mobile and interactive, is now fixed in position in Genoa, but one of our uh, special features, you might say, was the fact that we allowed our visitors to move this piece. So Albini, although he, has never had as much attention as Scarpa. Actually, we found many innovative aspects of his practice. We had a, a nice corner of our galleries which allowed the natural light to come in quite directly and also to create this beautiful transparent screen uh, based on the Sao Paulo model. Here's one of the pictures on a pole from Genoa, from the Palazzo Branco. And we re recreated these very exactly. And that's the transparent screen in detail. That's the original from Sao Paulo. And let's see what else I have here. Um, yes, let me just let me go back. Whoops, sorry. A moment to um, this here. The we recreated these um, poles and had the concrete cast. No, sorry, the stone carved. Richard will collect me, correct me later on all the details I get wrong. Um, and I think this combination of the different moments from different installations by Albini worked very nicely in our gallery. 
and actually provided a very tranquil moment in which people could sit down in the chairs, uh, could move the paintings, but um, I think this was the most contemplative part, despite the fact that Albini was quite, I think, more radical than maybe he's been seen previously in the way that he suspended these pictures, took off the frames, um, and allowed people to move them. Then we moved on, I would say, in my mind anyway, although in fact our gallery has ends, exits and entrances at both ends, so the, there was no fixed narrative. Then we moved on to the Scarpa area, <clears throat> which was very simple, very successful, I think, in that the recreation which Rita designed for the framing of the pictures, so they're set almost like miniatures on a page, um, gave the Scarpa the perfect uh, setting. Again, we had the daylight, more daylight than Scarpa would have had in the Correr Museum, and we set the pictures at right angles to the daylight. Here, uh, we had quite a long discussion about uh, how to deal with these easels, and Rita, in the end, persuaded me and Dirk that we had to borrow the original easels. So this is the only case where it's not a reconstruction. Uh, that we, we borrowed them from the Museo Correr in Venice with the help of Gabriele Belli, who was very understanding. And then we put um, the Gulbenkian pictures on to one. The other one we left empty so as to focus on the craftsmanship of the, the easel itself. This was very simple, but I think it was quite I think it conveyed very easily, very successfully, the strength of the Scarper approach to the image, the isolation of the image, uh, and it, its valorization. There's the, uh, <clears throat> the picture that we were working from, the, Im the space we were working from. And that, I suppose one sub-set or one sub-narrative of the exhibition was the easel. Um, and of course we jumped from Scarpa and Albini to Obardi, who was at the uh, far end of the room, but uh, very much uh, a kind of reinforced, exaggerated take on the question of the easel, which had been introduced in Italy earlier on, and which, of course, she knew, being Italian and having worked with them. So here, um, in fact, the, the reconstructions were easier because Rita was able to source the original designs, we had to pay for the license, but we the, the drawings were all there. This was easier. The uh, the easels are very much, uh, I, I would say, correct, except that we made for made one or two other decisions about the suspension um, and also about the sizes because originally the sizes were tailored to the pictures, and we instead made three sizes for small, medium, large. We had some anxiety about public safety, but in the end, no events, no incidents. Um, but I, I think that it was nice for us because our show worked uh, both forward and backwards. So you could go either way. Some people came upon this from the back and some came upon it from the front, which was a nice mixture of thinking about how Bobardi wanted to democratize art in, in quite a radical way. And I think to a degree, if you read Bobardi, it sounds almost as if she was against what Albini and Scarpa stood for in terms of the valorization of the artwork. But in the end, I felt that their, their texts, both Albini's and Bobardi's, maybe had to be reconsidered in the light of the actual experience because people were very much able to look at these works on Bo the Bobardi easels as works of art. Um, and similarly, I think that Albini was more radical um, and also interested in the democratization of art. And one of the things he wanted to achieve in the Gulbenkian was um, a comfortable place where people felt at home and felt at ease, which I think he did. So um, I feel that one of the things the show has taught me is to rethink the relationship between Bobardi and Albini. So here's the overall view of the Bobardi from behind. You can see how there's quite an interesting interplay with our windows onto the garden. Um, and we again, we were able to show 
a range of pictures from both the founders collection, historic works, and from the modern collection. I'm just looking at this picture because there's some surprising elements in it. I'm trying to work out what I'm looking at. Um, and you see here also how, how low our gallery is in comparison to what will happen at Rotterdam. So that um, it, has a, it has something of the quality, I think, of the Belvedere that Bobardi talked about. So I think we had a one-fifth of the original installation. So again, a fragment that I think enough to understand what she was aiming to achieve. And the similar kind of pairing and grouping of the easels. So we tried to be very faithful. And I think that's going to be one of the differences between Lisbon and Rotterdam. I think in a way, Rita's role was almost invisible in Lisbon. It's in Rotterdam where Jota Yeo is going to make the project. It will be very visible. It'll be a big contrast and interesting to look at the two. I can see, firstly, why it will be necessary to redesign the show, but also I think there'll be two very different approaches to compare <coughs> and contrast. But I, I do think that although Bobardi has been a figure of fascination for the last, let's say, decade or more, I think Albini has been somewhat forgotten in terms of the way that he introduced this suspended image. And this goes back to his own uh, apartment in Milan. This is from 1938, so before the war, before he made any museum projects, he was already working with his own collection of old master paintings, which were not highly valuable. And I think that gave him a degree of confidence and ease working with art, which I think you see with the Italians, with Scarpa and Albini. Um, and perhaps with that generation as well, they were able to be much more experimental than we can be now. So this is 1938, and this is something that Bobardi knew about, and she, she was close enough to Albini, and she had published some of his projects in her journals too. Scarpa, of course, as well. But there's a side view onto our almost tropical garden. You, could, you almost have a sense of Brazil. I think looking at. Now moving on to something which is very very different um, and this really is moving on to the area where Dirk is more specialized but we were able together to go to the home of the Smithson's daughter and to look at the original drawings uh, for the exhibition which they did in the Tate in, uh, in what is now Tate Britain but was then the Tate Gallery and funnily enough it was a show that was sponsored by the Gulbenkian, so there was a nice link back to, to Portugal. And this show, a uh, painting and sculpture of a decade, was designed in a bit of a rush, uh, mainly by Alison Smithson, and they had to incorporate over 350 artworks from Europe and America in a temporary setting, which was running down the nave of the Tate through the Duveen galleries, and through all the existing galleries to the right, if you enter. And you can see the drawings uh, vary, and uh, there's a kind of quick turnaround in terms of Alison Smithson's thinking about where the pictures can go. And she creates this uh, inner shell within the Tate, which disguises the classical architecture, and finds ways in which people are confronted by new art, new art from the last decade. And this was uh, fascinating, but especially difficult for Rita in terms of working out the dimensions. And to a degree, it was kind of free interpretation, I think you might say, of how to make the lighting fixtures and the walls. But we based the walls on what we knew of the Smithson's uh, use of kind of ready-made, uh, readily available panels, a standard size of panels. So nothing was bespoke here. Everything was off the peg, off the shelf, and it had to be done quickly and cheaply. So here you can see through the Bobardi towards the Smithson room, which we recreated in the center of the gallery. So it was almost like a kind of still heart and the only place actually where you couldn't see outside. 
And here you see very clearly the lighting fixtures, which were uh, quite closely adapted from what the Smithsons did, a kind of almost theatrical light and a tubular scaffold which supported it. And in the photographs which Dirk had got from the Smithson family, this looked incredibly clunky, even ugly, but in fact, the experience of being inside it was very, very successful. And I think that was the most surprising thing for me, that this area was um, probably the, one of the most successful areas for actually looking at art and allowing the art to take over from a display, which was always this kind of fine balance. But also, it, I must say that it's partly also because the collection of the Gulbenkian is so strong at this point. So we had really excellent pictures from the right period and by the right artists. So all the works we show, and here you can see Alan Davy and John Hoyland, all those artists were in the show. So even though we didn't have to go to actual original works, we had the right artists and works of the right scale as well. And I think that's quite clear. And you can see here the back of the screen. Um, and I think that was one of the nice aspects. And again, unexpected. People could go behind the scenes to see how the uh, walls were supported. And uh, there were nice juxtapositions that you could look behind the screen of the Smithsons and against the back of the wall of the Van Eyck. So we were very honest, I think, about how the show was made. There was no, no artifice. Um, and we we tried as hard as possible to get it right. When it came to the Van Eyck's, the Van Eyck areas, however, this was more, more challenging. And I think that if um, one was going to criticize the reconstruction, I guess it would be in the Van Eyck area that we would be criticized. Not so much for the early works, which you see in front of you, there are the two plinths. This again is a kind of composite the two plinths come from exhibitions made 10 years earlier than the wall in uh, the Stedelijk in Amsterdam and in the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Liège. The, I think, although we had to really guess the right dimensions for these plinths, I think we felt that we had successfully realized them. On the right, we had um, engravings, which in fact were by Vieira de Silva, because that's what we had in the collection but originally would have had cobra etchings on a very rough timber base. And they were laid out in a line that touched a kind of uh, L-shaped line. On the left, the piece we chose from the edge was a very low plinth, which originally had been covered in coal as a, a marker of the surrounding industry in the edge. We didn't use coal for two reasons. One for conservation, one because I think we thought that the cork made a nice similar link in Portugal as a local material. So we had a smoke darkened cork and um, a set of masks laid out on it. In the background, you can see a section of the famous Sonspec pavilion. And again, what you have in front of you is artworks all from our collection, which means they are not the original artworks, um, and more Portuguese than international. So in this area, again, especially in the sculpture rather than the painting, I think we had a less strong collection to show. The sculpture was further removed from what Van Eyck had been able to work with in Sunspec. Here you see the masks on the, the cork frame. And the only reason really for choosing these was that they were all by one artist, which had been the case originally in Liège. Um, and they were safe on the, on the to be left exposed uh, and sitting on the cork. And here you begin to see how difficult it is to um, recreate a Van Eyck wall. And we had a, a team of bricklayers who were really trying to understand how this had been constructed. Rita did her very best, but it was uh, perhaps you might say impossible to really recreate this wall because of the, the fact that the dimensions of the breeze blocks are different now. And 
we also um, had to make this decision about how to, which parts to remake. Originally, we thought we'd make a whole section in the interior gallery, but then we realized that it was both very dirty, would take too long, and would be too heavy for the load bearing of the gallery floor. So we made a decision to take it outside. Just going to move to there. So we put this outdoors um, so that any visitors who were coming to the museum would actually see this pavilion first. Um, and we put our, the sculptures which could withstand being outdoors, we put here. And in fact, although there's been so much discussion about the reconstruction of this pavilion, the walls were difficult. I think we got closer here in the roof to the original pavilion, whereas the current reconstruction, of course, has a more robust resistant roof, which is not so much like the soft textile of the original. So we were able in some areas, I think, to um, get closer to Van Eyck than the, the reconstruction currently in the Netherlands. I just put in here because I thought it was relevant in terms of my <coughs> trajectory, a project we did at the Tate in Tate Britain in 2016. Um, in which we reconstructed parts of the Rietveld Pavilion with the Barbara Hepworth sculptures. So I had already become quite interested in these, what I view as very, very uh, consistently successful backdrops for sculpture, which I think Van Eyck did so well. And it was nice to be able to see it, in fact, indoors and outdoors. And this is the famous ground plan of that original pavilion. And uh, we took about 40%, I think it was, of the original pavilion. And we managed to recreate it almost exactly. We only cheated in one small area. And that's how it looked in, um, in daylight um, as you came into the Gulbenkian. So you had this quite nice kind of long view in through the pavilion. Of course, the other aspect I should make clear is that the small plinth it's standing on uh, was something we had to do in Lisbon because of the ground level. It wasn't originally on a plinth, so it perhaps makes it a little bit too sculptural. But otherwise, I think it gave people a good sense of the, the roughness and uh, the, the texture of the, of the building. And that's how it looked from the gallery at sunset, a rather romantic view. But um, I think one that uh, we were pleased to have so that you could see from the exhibition gallery, the uh, section of the outdoor pavilion. So I've now got to the end of my slides and that has taken 40 minutes. So that was about right. Um, just, to, just to say really that in conclusion, what I originally wanted to do before even talking about it with other people was to find a way of putting the Gulbenkian building from 69 into the context um, of a wider European rethinking of how museums and exhibitions were made. And I think what we wanted to do was look at things which were more radical and less radical um, and to think about those different approaches and the ones which have lasted. And I, I guess the examples Scarpa, Bobardi, the Smithsons, Van Eyck, Albini, Helg, they're not uh, so unusual, they're quite well known. And some people came to the show and said, well, I, I knew all this before, I knew all these people. But I think what was unusual about our show was that very few people had had the chance to experience a careful reconstruction of those works, but also to compare them. So to think about the difference between Albini, Scarpa, Bobardi the Smithsons and Van Eyck. And although I think we thought for quite a while, Dirk and I, about other examples, we always came back to those five practices. It seemed that they were key to this period. In terms of the original idea of looking at Albini being old fashioned by the time the building opened, I, I don't know whether in the end uh, that was what the viewer would take away or whether Bobardi seemed much more exciting and modern than Van Eyck too. I think that in many ways Albini seems to have it, uh, really excited a lot of interest and 
in a way that helps us to explain why the museum here in Lisbon is still a successful museum. We could, of course, have made a bigger exhibition if we'd had more space. Um, I don't know if it would have been a better exhibition. I think for me, what was successful about the show was that it was uh, relatively constrained. The number of examples was quite small, but we did each of those uh, examples justice, I would say. It wasn't a show about archives and documentary photographs. It was a show about experience and we wanted it to be really open to the public in terms of experience. If, if we failed, and some people would say we failed in terms of visitor numbers, um, we failed because we didn't allow people, or people seemed to be cautious about allowing themselves to experience the architecture, the display, rather than the art. Um, and I think that that's a, a lesson that we learned. I don't still don't know how we might have overcome it. And it'll be very interesting to see whether it works differently in Rotterdam. So I'm going to uh, come to a temporary close there. It's the end for me, but it will be opening in Rotterdam very soon now in the new institute um, in the very beginning of October. And I think that Dirk is going to show just a few pictures to give people an idea of what might happen in Rotterdam. So I think I do stop show, is that right? Yeah. Um, Dirk, do we need, oh sorry Dirk, I think we need to make you a co-host. We're going to be able to do that. Yeah, that should be okay now. Can you share, Kid Thank you. Yes, I can share. Um, Hello. Hello, yeah. <laughs> to see. Good, good evening to you all. <laughs> good to see you on the screen. Uh, I'm, I'm now talking from Amsterdam. Uh, I can share the screen, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Penelope, for the careful uh, uh, discussion of our project, which was amazing to actually to be uh, invited to. to. Um, I certainly enjoyed it, and it's not over yet. <laughs> yeah, we can uh, see your, your PowerPoint, but, but not full screen. Here we go. It's a, it's a, why is it not? Oh yeah, there you go. So the collaboration between the Gulbenkian and the new institute, the new institute in Rotterdam may be a bit um, a surprise to some people. But I think we both share an intense interest uh, in how exhibitions are being made and what role exhibitions have to um, not only to reach out to an audience, but also to, to involve the audience. Um, and whereas the Gulbenkian works with uh, a, a, an eminent uh, collection um, in a very special building or two buildings and a beautiful garden, um, had new institute. Uh, the new institute uh, is a relatively young uh, institute created from uh, the better known Netherlands Architecture Institute and two other institutes, one for uh, digital culture and one for design. This was the, uh, the result of a new uh, culture policy that uh, um, started in 2012. Um, and one of the things that our director, Guus Bömer, then decided was uh, that um, with each exhibition, each publication, each presentation, um, we had a sort of duty obligation towards the design community to make these exhibitions for a platform, a platform for design experiments. So each exhibition is designed to, just to focus on the exhibitions, each exhibition is designed with uh, a selected uh, designer. And this is a show uh, on period rooms, uh, one from the Stedelijk Museum actually, uh, or used to be at the Stedelijk Museum, uh, and is now with the historic uh, Amsterdam Museum. Um, and it's a one-to-one -one reconstruction of this uh, particular period room. Um, so next, next to this, this development of, of uh, exhibitions, uh, museography as a special vehicle, a design platform, 
we were also interested in creating one-to-one -one reconstructions, just uh, as uh, the show in Ethical Banking. Uh, and this is also because we see, I think, the exhibition as an intervention and a transformation each time for our institute. It's a moment to not only reflect, but also to further research and investigate uh, our um, cultural uh, aspirations. So this is reaching back to the 19th century, bringing the 19th century back to the 21st century in Rotterdam. It was also a learning environment. Students would come here every week to work uh, with these elements and also put them in place. So only at the end of the exhibition, it was finished. Uh, and then there was a whole uh, other uh, program around it. So also the crates were there and, and, and turned into a little pavilion. But we also have a one-to-one, -one, so to speak, set piece, the House Sonnefeld from 1930 in our collection by Van der Vlucht. And we ask artists and architects to do interventions. This is by Petra Bles from the office Inside Outside. And she used the idea of uh, yeah, hard surfaces, uh, shiny surfaces and body mirror floors creating a, a fantastic intervention, a whole new way of looking at an older piece. I think that's, that's also part of our project in, with Art on Display, to look anew at these older uh, exhibition concepts and also to look anew at the artworks and how you can display artwork. This is a show on photographic sets. So it's by famous, it's about, it's photo sets for a famous photographer. Erwin Olaf, whose work is in the collection of the Rijksmuseum. Uh, but we didn't show his work, we showed the photo sets, also one-to-one, -one. perfect, yeah, uh, scenographies. Okay, so now I'm moving on, I'm jumping this, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, but this is basically to show that we also think of exhibition spaces as social spaces and research spaces. Uh, performance spaces, uh, space for conversation, and that we will also do that for the uh, when the art on display reopens in Rotterdam. Uh, we will develop a whole discursive program uh, because, as a curator, I also think that working with the edition in uh, Portugal and now uh, doing a new edition in Rotterdam, for me, this is also a, a research project in progress. Uh, so it's not to create a finished object that people then can just visit and uh, enjoy, I hope, of course. But it's also indeed a research to see what can you do, what can a reconstruction do? And uh, of course the space in the cool bank is very different. It's a totally beautiful space with the immediate views on the gardens. The light is fantastically generous. Uh, and it's a linear space. It's it's the, as the interior of the museum, the Gulbenki Museum, is like like a walk in the garden itself. It's like a picturesque walk uh, through a very beautiful landscape, through the private collection of uh, Carlos Gulbenki. So th this is what Penelope also was talking about, and which was difficult for us, together with Rita, to develop. The, there's two entries or two ends to the show and there's a kind of flowing space in which you can then develop the narrative or at least the experience for the visitor. Now the space in Rotterdam, so this is really a sneak preview, <laughs> it's, it's still work in progress too. We're now working with the light installations for instance and where uh, the artwork should go uh, exactly. We already have some ideas but they need to be more precise. So ours is a, it's a square room uh, and for the people who don't know it, in Rotterdam, so you enter here, it's only one entrance, so it's an asymmetrical entrance and this is a lower area and here is a very high area in the center and here you have a view over a, a pond and there's also lots of light coming from there. So this, this is not the final uh, design uh, yet, but basically uh, what we asked to uh, Jo Tailleur to do, because we don't have, so Rita Albegaria, who worked a lot with Gulbenkian, 
and who has a perfect understanding of uh, the room uh, in the uh, Gulbenkian, almost instinctively she knew how to position certain elements. Um, here we work each time anew with a new design, this time Jota Jö, because I think he works great with reconstruction, with the idea of the fragments uh, uh, and how uh, this can work as a, yeah, an extra layer, so to speak, to the exhibition concept itself. Um, and what you see here is that he took the Smithson room as a start and from this uh, folded wall uh, that he had to uh, rethink, uh, he then develops another language of walls to create inside the larger room, which is not as beautiful, our room is not as beautiful as the Gulbenkian room, I'm afraid. Um, I hope the Institute won't mind me saying this, but uh, so he created sort of uh, interiors inside a room in which then the art could then uh, be uh, on display. And we will bring in less art um, to uh, than, than was in the Gulbenkian exhibition, not because um, because the transport costs are in the end too high. Uh, to uh, accommodate. So we will focus, it will be a much more conceptual approach and will be a reinterpretation of the idea of the reconstruction. Here with some art or indications of art pieces. So the Smithsons here, can you move on to Albini and Helg? Uh, the room of uh, uh, Lina Bobardi will be quite uh, exciting uh, uh, to see what the result will be because Yo is uh, 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 he proposed a mirror wall here as if to, as a sort of implicit comment on the idea of reconstruction. And then we walk on here to Scarpa and the, here are some uh, special play. This has changed completely, devoted to Van Eyck. Um, you might know uh, this from the Biennale. This is uh, by Jo Tailleur together with Inge Fink and Jan de Velder. One of the reasons I really wanted to work with him. And here are some models that he made together with uh, Esther Schepens for uh, our show in Rotterdam. Uh, so there will be, there's a whole play about backs uh, and fronts, insides and outsides, and we work with the special graphic information also. The, uh, with this layering. And this is the last image. And uh, now, yeah, this is real architectural drawing. Uh, so, uh, for the experience, um, I'm inviting you uh, to come to Rotterdam, of course. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, two wonderful presentations. Uh, we do have time for a few questions if, if anyone has any. Um, I, I mean, I was intrigued. Um, I mean, it does feel like a, you're describing a quite a particular moment in architectural culture uh, where architectural exhibitions were, sorry, architectural interventions were being made where there was a very explicit encounter being um, invited between architecture and fine art. Maybe the, with the work of Robrecht and Dam, one can still see in some of their projects that sort of level of, uh, level of, confrontation at play. But I just wondered why you felt, both of you, that, well, do you agree that this was a sort of a moment that came to an end? And if so, why? And I guess a related question is, which, what was the response of artists of, to, to the, the kinds of, um, the, to the, the installations that you were showing kind of at the time? Um, I would say that there was still a strong belief that art in the in this period, let's say when around 1960, the fine art was very important. But and the belief was that fine art was important, and therefore more people had to see it. I think now some people would question whether fine art was so important as then it was a given that fine art was important, and it was also seen that it had to be made more accessible. I think we both felt in reading around this area that we were looking at a very European question in terms of the post-war. It was a lot to do with reconstruction. Um, 
to find a way of making art available to the wider public after uh, fascism, after the totalitarian states, how to create museums that were welcoming and not overpowering. I think that was something that was clearly important in, in the Gobenkian project. With them. The original program was designed by a woman called Maria José de Mendonça. Um, and although the Gobenkian building was built when Salazar was still in power, um, there was a sense that this should be seen as a democratic building, I think, quite strongly. Maybe that was an unspoken, it had to be unspoken uh, feeling. I think the Scarpa and Albini, you know, they had to, they had so many projects that were coming out of the war. It was all to do with the, the, the ruins of World War II in Italy and, ha and how to bring art back to life and give it a contemporary feeling. So I think it, it was an important moment because it mattered, it was significant. People believed in fine art and they believed that architecture could be the way to allow people to see art better. I, th I think now there's, there's so much more doubt about the value of fine art. Architects, as we know, have become in, in, in many cases um, dominant so that the artwork is not, I think there isn't that happy relationship which many of these uh, architects we've noticed were close to artists. They, they either were friends with artists personally or they had a, their own artworks like Albini. Uh, they were at home with art um, and they knew what it needed and even when they were experimental they respected it. And I, I think that another thing that is so clear is that it's very, very difficult to be experimental with fine art now, with historic fine art especially. Whereas in these years, people, maybe after World War II, it was inevitable. People tried things out in a quite relaxed way. Um, and that's, we had a taste of that in Lisbon, that we were able to use our own collection. And we could do things that um, normally you wouldn't be able to do. So it's a kind of combination of respect, but also a, a kind of a more relaxed atmosphere, I think made it a special moment. Um, we have a question from Arthur. Um, two seconds, Arthur. Yeah, you've got the microphone. Hi. Um, I just, um, when you were talking about the, the, the difficulty you had finding um, Albini archival information just made me think how much uh, exhibition design must get lost uh, and I wonder whether you thought there was a case for for sharing that with with the viewing public at, at the time of the exhibition um, sort of thereby drawing their attention to to to, to, to what their their experience uh, of the space and, and 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 the design decisions that they might not otherwise have noticed yes I mean, of course there is a case, and maybe Rotterdam will do more of that than Lisbon did. I think, I think we tried to be honest in Lisbon, but not to make it too complicated and too many layers, because once you start to try and do too many things in a show, then it's really complicated. And we wanted to essentially present the reconstructions as well as we could make them, without too much kind of, I don't know, above or below. I think that I think in, in Rotterdam, there'll be a chance to have a much more intellectualized approach to thinking about exhibition reconstruction. Oh, sorry. Um, do you, maybe you'd like to... Yeah, but me, yes. <laughs> you have to take the phone. Yeah, no, so, but, but you, there was also a really nice uh, intervention uh, at the entrance, which showed a competition, of course, uh, for the Gulbenkian uh, building. And then in each room, or in many rooms, there were special um, panels, glass panels with uh, historical photos of the original uh, interiors. Uh, that was very elegant. Um, so it, it meant that we talked about the historical display, but we. Didn't I think I just, I just meant, I meant more, more, more generally in 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 any given um, museum exhibition. Yes, I do. Um, I mean, I, I, I've always thought that installations get underplayed and catalogues because publishers want catalogues to be ready for the opening it means they yeah. so rarely show the yeah. installation um, and reviews very rarely talk about the installation so we knew that we were talking to 
you might say, a, a select public, who, which included artists, certainly. Um, and I've seen the impact of the show already in terms of uh, artists working in Lisbon. But people who are really interested in this came a long way to have a look at it because normally there isn't so much discussion about it and it's not, it's not very visible. Um, and we were able in, in the catalogue to include the installation shots, so we actually did have a, a proper record, and that is so often missing. Yeah, and yeah. for instance, the Aldo van Eyck uh, Cobra exhibitions, there's no, there's no document, there's a few photos of the two shows, there's no drawings. It was also done with very little money, of course. A um, l'improviste, uh, you could say. There's also, of course, a big difference with exhibitions today. The, the, uh, there's so much money involved, um, yeah, which, which creates a very different context, of course. Yeah. Thanks. No, I, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about the, the, the catalog going to press dimension, but, but thank you both. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm intrigued, particularly the possibilities of now that we've, we've been working on Zoom for the last three months of of how we could build, for instance, an Architecture Foundation archive out of you know conversations on uh, using this very simple technology, and maybe the, the subject of exhibition design is another one which which one could which one can revisit and then kind of um, you build up an build up an archive quite readily. Um, it was fantastic tonight. Thank you so much. Um, we have one. Yes. Oh, yeah. Did you, you have a? Is there a question waiting? I don't believe so, unless you're seeing I, I would like. I would like. I know that Rita Albergeria is here. Yes. Face at some point, Rita. I wonder if you could just make a comment or two. It'd be nice. Rita, I've given you the microphone. If you fancy that idea. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Uh, um, there's not much more to add. Uh, just uh, in the line of uh, the last uh, question, I think I can uh, add that, uh, in fact, there is not, not many material to work with in terms of the history of what the design was uh, in that period. Uh, Albini, through all the drawings and the detailed drawings of the constructions that he designed uh, out when, before he died, and there's many others that, as Scarpa, that didn't share the drawings with anyone. He used to draw the construction details in sight. So there, it was very difficult for us to make um, uh, this uh, design and to be as real, as, as close to the, 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 the real design as possible. But uh, in fact, for me, it was, in, amazing to work with uh, first the two curators and be able to work on this exhibition but to study these five uh, um, architects and to be able to try to understand what was the thinking uh, behind a picture because sometimes we just have pictures and not any drawing at all and um, for me um, I think this exhibition is uh, a very I, I know that Penelope doesn't agree with me, but I think it's a very conceptual uh, exhibition in terms of the way the different projects relate with each other inside the exhibition gallery. And that is very important and that's why the visitors were very comfortable coming from uh, each project to the other. And uh, in fact, it is true that usually the visitors don't mind the, the museography or the architecture behind the art object and that's why it was so difficult for us to have a very large number of visitors because yeah. they are appealed to see the objects and not the display and that's why this exhibition was amazing to to do because even though we didn't have a, 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 a very large number of visitors i think we made some history because in terms of of the photographs of the exhibition, mm. the uh, catalog, we have uh, uh, a memory that remains of what was done on that period and relating it to something that still is ha happening as the Gulbenkian Museum. So I think it's, it was really incredible to work on this project. <laughs>